And, and I think that is really the perfect challenge to this audience. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it's you and us and the people you work with. So I do want to open it um, for thoughts. You don't have to ask questions. If you have questions, you are welcome to. But to kind of share your thoughts about the many different experiences, challenges, ideas, controversies um, that all of our members of this conversation so far have had. But this is a conversation. And we need your voices as well. So, okay. I hear one. I see one over here. I'm going to stand up. Not to lord it over you, but so I can see people because I'm short. <laughs> I'm. I, I would, and you, you want to tell us who you are, also? Oh yes, of course. Um, my name is Robin Dickerson Bell. I'm with 1199. Uh, Vaughn is. I'm his student. I'm learning so much passion <laughs> from everyone today. Um, this part of the conference, I've worked with so many different aspects of the poor people challenge and and all of this which is the first thing I've heard from me. Um, but the Brazilian community, um, mm -hmm. I live in Everett, and we have a, a, a many new neighbors of the Brazilian immigrating. And uh, no one I can take something back to my neighbors mm -hmm. who really have nothing to do with my work or anything, but to know that I have information. I can't speak the language, but I know I can say, this is what I have. And then they can pass it on because it's you know it's a whole new community coming in. A lot have to happen to be my neighbors. So I've gotten so much, and I want to thank you for giving me information and knowledge that again I'm passing on. But really, it's nothing to do except to help them and give them information, which in turn is helping me to learn more. So I want to say thank you to the panel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's, there's another phrase that we often talk about, each one teach one. Mm -hmm. okay. So you just exemplified that. Yeah, Fyla. And, and introduce yourself because we don't all know, I know who you are, but they don't. Uh, my name is Faith Rodriguez. I'm a student here at UMass Dartmouth. And I wanted to say I really appreciate the with indigenous folks and that doesn't only mean uh, native folks but also means people who live in that community and work in that community um, so I'll just say that but I, I want to talk a little bit about the work that we do with the Apache stronghold um, there are um, ancestral lands in um, the uh, west uh, the southwest that are um, coalition members and members of the Poor People's Campaign that are members of the Apache Stronghold who are fighting to get a sacred uh, land where they do ceremonies and the rites of passage ceremonies at um, back. So we've been on the front lines with them, um, fighting for them to, um, I forget the, the name of the, the bill. Clinton might be able to help me. No, you don't know. I know it's against uh, Resolution Copper. That's what it is. So, but, so we're fighting the U.S. government. So, you know, <laughs> what we're all trying to do, right? Um, and so we, we are taking uh, leadership directly from uh, these folks um, fighting for uh, their land rights and their land back, um, but also standing uh, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, um, supporting, because we know that the fights that they're having um, are interconnected uh, to um, all the issues that we as an oppressed people are trying to overcome. We may not all have the exact 
issues, right, that are affecting us, but we all have, have something as, um, that we're working to improve, to work on, whether it's, you know, workers' rights, um, living wages, healthcare, education, uh, access to clean water, food, all of these things, and working together, I think something that Vaughn um, inspired me to, to, to touch on is this urgency that we have. We have an urgency right now to, to address these issues. I mean, the urgency has been there, and a lot of folks in this room have been working for 20, 30, 40, 50 years on these, these issues, and I feel as a young person, but also someone who has been organizing for a little while now, some disappointment that things haven't been moving fast enough. Sometimes I feel like things are not moving um, as fast as they could be. And I feel now more than ever an urgency. Um, so I know it's a little, off, you know, veering a little off of your original question, um, but we have an urgency right now to join with um, groups that are, are working, like you said, um, in indigenous populations um, to help build more coalitions across all lines of divisions and across the lines that uh, the powers that be want to, you know, keep us separated and keep us not working together. I want to, do you want to say something? I want to say something as well. Please. Yeah, oh, um, also, uh, one of the many hats I wear, I'm the secretary of the New Bedford branch of the NAACP. The NAACP has built coalitions with different tribal councils in the region. And I don't know if, if you've heard, or I don't know if you're originally from this area, but there is one tribe that's trying to reclaim ancestral land in the city of Fall River. I immigrated to Fall River and grew up in Fall River. When, you know, I, I actually still live there. I mean, um, a lot of my family is there. And in the north part of the city, where is the Fall River Freetown Forest, for growing up as a child, it was always referred to as the reservation, mm -hmm. meaning this land, right. you know what I mean? Uh, as a young child in the city. And so there is, we're, there, we're working with, our branch is working in coalition with that particular tribe. And we work in coalition with other tribes, like they're trying to straighten out the issue with the mascot issue at Dartmouth mm -hmm. High School, which is like, mm -hmm. you know, you, well, you know what that's about. It's all over the mm -hmm. news. Uh, and, and they're trying to work within that and within the Indian councils of like with the federal government and state government to try to reclaim the ancestral land back. You know what I mean? And so just to, just to point out that, that, you know, there are different groups working mm -hmm. in, in, and coalescing together to sort of like work on, you know, some, some issues, especially those with, uh, you know, the native uh, indigenous folks of this land to try to reclaim their ancestral land back. So. I just want to, I don't want to speak on behalf of CCT, but I just want to point out a couple of things. So the Central American community in New Bedford is largely indigenous, Guatemalan, the Maya Quiche people who, yeah. whose first language is not Spanish, mm -hmm. right? Many of whom don't speak Spanish at all, really. And who for reasons of, you know, historical racism and genocide, um, many are not, you know, lettered in any language, including their own first language. So there are many, many obstacles and challenges. So for example, health and safety information that's printed in English, mm -hmm. right, and printed, right? Because people don't, in fact, really relate that much to the printed word. So finding other ways, so for example, during the pandemic, Right, the early, and we're still in a pandemic, um, but the first part, the official part of the pandemic, getting information to people, mm -hmm. explaining things, you know, in, in the language they understood. There have been some gains, for example, the public schools in New Bedford now have a K'iche interpreter who works with parents, um, which is really important because we've talked about alliances and coalitions. Workers are often, not all, are parts of families, mm. different kinds of families, different mm -hmm. kinds of households. Mm -hmm. Some have children, some have elders, some have you know other family members, but many have children in the public schools. Over, I think it's now over, and Ricardo, you can kind of tell me if you're still here. Uh, it was, at one point, it was close to 40% of the students in the New Bedford public schools um, were 
what are classified as Hispanic Latino, which obviously includes the indigenous population that doesn't identify as Hispanic because they were the conquerors, um, or not the conquerors, but the colonizers. So I think that there are, you know, definitely some issues um, and, you know, ways that people try to address to make sure that information, so part of like bills of rights, which are extraordinarily significant, or information about driver's license, educating that the education and the information and the tools are in languages that people understand which include indigenous languages, which include, you know, the many languages that people in Massachusetts speak, not just, I mean, it's great to have Portuguese and Spanish as well, but, you know, Cape Verdean Creole, Haitian Creole, but we can talk about all the languages that we need to be educating and informing people so that the access is there for everyone. So thank you very much for raising a really crucial, yes. Well, Oh. Camilo, Camilo told me that because there wasn't <laughs> anything happening until 6, that we could actually go a little bit later. So if he told me wrong, I'm sorry, but he said we could go until 5. So, so yeah. thank you. Yes, I Jen. Just, I just um, reflecting on what you said that you were introduced to the program. John Luke Cranberry. Okay. You said, and I hear all of this collaboration, but young people are not at the table. Mm -hmm. And I was a young person that mm -hmm. was able to benefit off the leadership <laughs> and the lineage of, of radical traditions of New Bedford that I'm so grateful for. Mm -hmm. And my largest, my hope is young people, but my fear is that we're not passing these on to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not building capacity. They're not learning how to organize or what to organize for. They're not grounded in this work. And I was very mm -hmm. fortunate. Um, There's some of them sitting at that table <laughs> right there. Hopefully they're they're catching some of it. <laughs> but I'm talking about young people. I know. No, I know. I know. Yeah. I'm talking about young people that are being pushed out of high school. Mm -hmm. I'm yep. talking about indigenous, mm -hmm. uh, native, and it just other yeah. pockets of young people that yeah. don't necessarily mm -hmm. make it here. I was a high school Absolutely. dropout. I made it here because of that legacy and because of that mm -hmm. tradition and method that held me, that community that held me. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think we really need to be thinking about how we're bringing young people into these spaces and passing these skills because I was able to do that organizing work when I was very young because of the leadership around me, you know. So I just want us to all reflect on that. How are we bringing them in and really making them part of this movement? And they're, they're the power. They're the fire, you know. Um, so I just want to just gone. have people think about that. No, thank you so much. Do you mind if I just... Please. And um, then, so, then I... Yeah. Great. For the two of you, and then we have somebody over there who also wanted to add something. Yeah. So, like, yes, absolutely. Like, coming in as a young person was, what do you call it, fundamentally changed my trajectory of my life, right? Like, to be able to, like, set me on a path. Um, and that definitely can, that definitely should still be happening now. I don't think it, like, right now, the youth movement, I'm going to say for Boston, <laughs> <laughs> the youth movement of Boston is, uh, a little bit in a precarious position. We are there are a lot of organizations that are like rebuilding, but mm -hmm. we are like stepping into a, a space where we are trying to continue to build coalition. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of groups. Um, I'm actually we all count me on the tail end of my time here at Clue. So I've been here for five years. I'm actually transitioned to being the executive director of a youth organizing uh, camp. Uh, we're called the City School. We're over in Upham's Corner in mm -hmm. Dorchester. Nice. Um, but we are like with a number of different youth groups. Um, we work on giving young people the fundamentals, like of social uh, social justice education. Working on getting them the reps, door knocking, mm -hmm. like doing like all the those other organizing mm -hmm. pieces. But like very much so, there is a there is a thought, and it is a what do you call it? The group think that we need to be reinvesting in young people, and it's clear. It is also just clear that you know, different than back in the day, back when I was a young person. Like there is also not as much investment as there was mm -hmm. in like youth organizing and the youth movement. Um, so definitely, um, mm -hmm. we're pushing. We need to be folks in this room need to be out here being able to support. We need to mm -hmm. be pushing folks that are funding this. We need to be getting our own funders, and I'm also really trying to connect these youth groups and these young people to labor as well. Right? There's mm -hmm. a uh, we call it, we said earlier that labor didn't look like us. Mm -hmm. Like. One of the first things that happened when I stepped into the Community Labor United space, I, I was at like a labor breakfast and I saw the leadership and it did not look like me. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact that the people that worked those jobs looked like me. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. How do we get our young people to be 
those folks that are in the next level and the next run that are going to be leadership that can be representing their own interests, the interests of their families, and so on and so forth. Those are that's the kind of thinking that we're doing right now. It's the kind of thing that I'm doing and trying to push forward um, as we're moving. So thank you, definitely. Vaughn, did you want to address that as well? I, I, I have to acknowledge one great leader uh, who spent her time with young people. Ella Baker. Mm -hmm. Ella was remarkable that. because you don't find too many pictures about her. Mm -hmm. You don't find too many speeches. In fact, if you find a speech online, let me know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, and she founded an organization dedicated to you, mm -hmm. Student Nonviolent Coordinating mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Committee. We know who came out of that. Mm -hmm. We know mm -hmm. John Lewis, mm -hmm. Bob Moses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The list goes on and on. May we be humble enough mm -hmm. to be like Ella Baker. Mm -hmm. May we be humble enough. And another one, Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'd, I'd add to that. Sure. Uh, something reflecting on something we heard this morning that Bill Fletcher was talking about, about not being an afterthought. Mm -hmm. um, we we really need to practice what we preach and appreciate Dr. DeBarros and mm -hmm. Kaleem pointing it out. Like we, we need to let the youth lead. Mm -hmm. As much as we have to teach uh, youth, they have a lot to teach us about the way the world mm -hmm. that they live in right. is like every mm -hmm. single day. That's right. And we have a lot to learn from each other. And learning intergenerationally is crucial mm -hmm. to building coalitions too. And we haven't been talking about that enough and we need mm -hmm. to. Because this is the world. This is their world that we're trying mm -hmm. to build, right. and they need yeah. to be a part of it. They need to be front and center, mm -hmm. and they need to learn as they lead. Yes. I just want to mention one thing. There's a nation of people. Uh, one of the first nations mm -hmm. that practice democracy is the Oromo people of Ethiopia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have a system called the Gada system. In their nation, in order to be success, you have to have succession. It's not about you, but who comes after you. That's right. Because mm -hmm. in, in our culture, success is about you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in their culture, it's about who comes after you. Mm -hmm. So if you're not passing it on to young people, come on, mm -hmm. you are not a success. There you go. If you're not passing it on to those that can carry it on beyond you, come on. then it ain't even about you. Mm -hmm. No, and looking at my student from the environmental justice class, we've been talking about indigenous conceptions of the environment and our responsibility as going to the seventh generation, right? And I think that's a really important. So not just me, not just my kids, my grandkids, but my grandkids, grandkids, mm -hmm. grandkids, mm -hmm. or not my, not my direct biological descendants, but those future generations of thinking very far, thinking in the present, living in the present, working to make change in the present, but also thinking about what comes after. You had your hand up before, so I want to make sure you get a chance to say something. My name is Dan Harris. I'm a member of the NAACP. Um, I've heard a lot about intersection, intersectionality and coalitions and uh, leadership development and uh, organizing and civil rights and workplace safety and all these swirling topics. The one thing I have heard mention of today is politics. Um, it, in order for any of these things to happen, it's going to take political system, and political uh, representation to bring it about. So my question is really just sort of a, just asking you to your questions. Um, forget the Republicans. How are the Democrats, uh, how are the Democrats helping you? And is there any thought to the establishment of a political party that actually represents working class people? I'm just a small question for the <laughs> conversation. How many, how many hours do we have now? <laughs> well, I'll just say one thing, because I'm not going to forget the Republicans, because Democrats and Republicans are both voting uh, to keep wages low. Mm -hmm. to keep us from having universal health care, mm -hmm. to keep us from having affordable housing, to keep us spending more than 50% of our tax dollars on the military. So this is not 
a Republican versus Democrat issue. This is not about left versus right. This is about right versus wrong. Yep. And that's why we have responsibility as people, as people who have the ability to vote, to mm -hmm. vote for candidates uh, who will enact the policies that our communities need. I will say this too as well. Um, it, for me, it goes one step further than just electing f folks. And I look at this in, in different ways, again, coming from community and labor, like we've, we've run community cam candidates. Mm -hmm. We've run labor candidates, mm -hmm. right? How are we supporting these candidates when they are actually seated, if they actually win, mm -hmm. to be able to continue to do that work that we know them do, not just to be like, okay, we put you in power or we put you in place, now do that thing that we want you to mm -hmm. do. We need to be able to support like them, right? Like, we, like that comes with making sure that they have good research so that they can back up what they're saying out there. Like if, the, if it comes with uh, making sure that we still have community folks that are, uh, on ballots and pushing things and knocking doors to get, make sure that folks are informed so that they can support um, whatever policy is being put forward. We need to make sure that the people that are talking in their ear are our people, mm -hmm. right? So that also is a big, big, big piece um, of it. Like I can, it, it, what do you call it? This is not a slow, it's, it is a, not a quick process. Uh, I think as we've, we've laid out here, like I, I think about the young people um, that I've had the, uh, the privilege of working with that are now staffers in like in the state house in, in what do you call or staffers in city hall or have like probably folks that are my age that have been elected to city council um, that we have to make sure that like we're like we're kind of like protect we're not even actually protecting them because they're also going to be protecting us but we're like we're uh, connecting with each other and making sure that we're still holding hands as they move forward because this elected, we call it, this political process is not just about people that we put in power, but how we're holding them accountable and how they, how they understand that they're accountable to us. So. Yeah. And ju just one more thing. Yeah. And I will call and, on. And, and also along with I just that. I want to let the, everyone on the panel think, who has something they want to say. I think it's important for us as well that when we have someone in place in office that we her. voted for and we know that they're doing what they're doing, like as an example, when Ayana and all the other three uh, and the other three uh, women in Congress got attacked by 45, mm. you know what I mean? That I'm not saying that we had to take to the streets or whatever, but just as an individual, you know the resources, get on your phone and just like text Ayana. I'm like, you stand tall. Um, I, I got your back. I, you know, I'm a voter. I live in Massachusetts. I voted for you. You stand tall. I got your back. You know what I mean? Just to sort of like also because these people are in the front line of this garbage that's going on in D.C. And so we also have to then also support those that are really taking a stand as well as as well as holding people accountable yeah. for when they get elected as well so i just have to put that out there yeah and i, I think also I, um, that you know like lyndon johnson didn't start the war on poverty just because he read a book he That's did right. because people because people were in the streets oh, absolutely. people absolutely. were in the streets they were camping out and the mall. They were camping out in Washington. They were in, you know, encampments. People were pushing. So I think that's part of it. I mean, we can talk about who we should elect or whatever, but it's it's really the feet the on the streets, that's the movement right. that makes yeah. it happen. Sanaji, you wanted to... Uh, yes, hi. And obviously this question goes out for those who were organizing out. Um, because, you know, I find myself in certain situations in 2023 wishing that it could be better and knowing that, you know, we have the capacity to do so, but don't have the tools, like cannot imagine the tools, I guess. Um, so I just wanted to ask what um, the, I guess, main summary was um, for those who, um, you know, found it within themselves to, to, communi uh, to organize community. I'm going to hear about my main is you gotta have a conversation with somebody. One to ones are the king of organizing. Like, if you cannot sit down with somebody and talk to them about what it is that affects them, what it is that they care about, you're not gonna get far. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I always think back to is uh, this brother G2 Brown, 
who uh, comes out of Chicago, uh, we were talking, he shared an anecdote with me. He was like, I went into the school district to go do organizing. We were like, we wanted to get folks on a school site council. And there was this woman who I knew had a bunch of people with her. She could move and she could talk to people and they would listen to her and so on and so forth. So I was like, I want you on this school site council. <laughs> and she was like, I need there to be a stop sign at the end of this road to make sure that our babies aren't getting hit when these cars are flying out of here at X, Y, and Z. He needed to actually have that conversation with her to be like, I, he's like, I see something. And she was like, great, I'm glad you're talking. This is what I need. Help meet my needs. And mm -hmm. call it, there's that also that, that, that good grunt work um, that my mentor always taught me. Um, like you have to do that background stuff. Like, all right, this is the need that this person needs. I've, I've connected with them. Now I know what they need. He got that stop sign put in. One of his best organizers that he's ever had, and then like, like, and that was like five years that she was doing it. But we have to have conversations. We have to have a million conversations mm -hmm. to even understand what it is that we all need. What connects us to make sure that we can fight for the same thing. Yeah. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, I want to mention something which is important. I raised a question earlier today. I'm not going to say who I raised it to, but there was some <laughs> in the room that asked. I was talking about a particular method of organizing, because organizing itself is universal. Mm. Let me explain. The right organizes and knocks on doors That's true. for different reasons. Mm -hmm. They connect with values, and they get out, and, and, and sometimes they, they win elections. But those elections that they win are used to, to destroy us. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it, it's not just about organizing, it's about consciousness raising, mm -hmm. and particularly for the purpose of liberation. Mm -hmm. You understand liberation from poverty, liberation from injustice, from the systemic evil. You know, if we are connecting around the, the moral and ethical values that relate to us, then our, 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 our conversations are, are important. We gotta make sure that we're in this, because our goal is, is to de de demolish and to destroy the enemies that are organized against us. Because mm. if we're not, they, they will out-organize us. Mm. Mm -hmm. They will out-converse us. Just wanted to put that out there. Well, I want to thank everyone here for their engagement in this conversation. We do need to stop because <laughs> there's another event you can come back for Bill Fletcher, who is going to be signing his book. For those of you who didn't get a chance to hear him this morning, a chance to engage with him in a slightly more uh, intimate and informal way. And then we hope you, uh, some of you have joined, will be joining us for the banquet, uh, the labor. The book signing will be here, but I think they need to rearrange the tables a little bit for that. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Mo, who is the director of the Unity House and the co-organizer of this conference to tell us the next steps. Hello, everybody. Beautiful people. We started the morning talking about the importance of coalition building. Our hope for this conference was to create a space that we can engage, understand more deeply, and be committed to actions on our way out of here. We hope, from what you've heard from all of our panels, that in fact we are interdependent, we need each other to be effective, and there is no other way. A coalition building is effective for regressive forces, it is more effective for those of us who are struggling for a better world to create a space where justice prevails. So I, we, the committee, really, it's beyond our imagination how successful today would be. Uh, and we are elated that you came, that you stayed, that you engaged, that you spoke, that you asked questions. And we are looking forward to next year. We are look, looking forward to an amazing conference next year with your participation and more. So thank you, thank you for coming. 
It's been an amazing day. Uh, and thank you to the panelists. Wonderful ending of the day.